investigators are on the trail of a serial killer who's leaving behind a series of almost invisible clues. In Maine, police depend on a few paltry fibers to sew up a case against a deadly rapist. The evidence is in hand, but they have nothing to compare it against. Florida investigators confront a fast car, a fatal accident, an unlikely story. Can forensic scientists use fibers from the crash scene to find out what really happened? Tiny filaments, practically invisible to the naked eye, are the key to solving these crimes. In the lab, scientists can weave the truth from the shreds of evidence. In 1981, a peaceful hike in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia, ended with a grim discovery. The body of a young man was lying at the edge of a field. For Atlanta police, it was the kind of scene that was becoming all too familiar. For 21 months, more than two dozen bodies had turned up in fields, empty lots, and less traveled roads. The victims were young African-American males. Some were children. Most were strangled. At first, the crimes were investigated routinely. But as the murder count climbed, it became clear a serial killer was on the loose. He would leave few clues in his deadly wake. Parents of the victims demanded answers. And as more bodies turned up, police assembled a task force to find a link among the murders and to trace every clue. But the murders continued. Lawmen from the surrounding area joined citizens, even psychics, in the search for victims and their killer a reward fund reached $100,000, but no one came forward to claim it. Racial tensions grew as panic gripped this southern city. Assuming the crimes were racially motivated, police looked for a white male, and the outcry for justice in the African-American community grew deafening. As the death toll climbed past 20, Investigators hoped it was only a matter of time before they caught the killer. But time was their enemy, and they had few clues. At the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, microanalyst Larry Peterson set his sights on the almost invisible clues known as trace evidence. I began applying more or less full-time efforts into looking at the cases individually and also comparing them to see if they were related. Peterson was counting on fiber evidence to be the common thread that bound killer and victims. By their nature, fibers are easy to pick up, hard to brush off. They provide a nearly invisible record of every place a person visits. By the same token, every victim was literally covered in hundreds of fibers, most of them meaningless. To find out which strands were important required a concentrated effort. Each fiber collected from one victim had to be visually compared against hundreds pulled from the next. Multiply that by 20 victims, and investigators were examining hundreds of thousands of fibers. The task could easily stretch into months. It's hard to determine automatically what bits of material are important that could be from, let's say, a killer's environment, what bits of material is from the victim's own home, from places that they frequent.
Using a stereo microscope that renders the fiber evidence in three dimensions, Peterson analyzed fibers culled from the crime scenes and during autopsies. Their length, shape, and texture suggested some were from a household carpet, others were from an automobile. I was still looking for any other kind of evidence that may link different cases together in addition to the ones I had already found. After scanning hundreds of samples, Peterson singled out fibers with similar characteristics. On most of the bodies, he kept coming across purple acetate fibers as well as yellow-green fibers that appeared to be from a carpet. As the evidence began to accumulate, he needed more specialized microscopes. To see if they were from the same source, he placed the carpet fibers on a high-magnification comparison microscope. It allowed him to compare the fibers side by side. Their colors and shapes matched. Peterson was encouraged. Perhaps that was the link he needed. He now had proof that all the victims were connected in some way and that they were probably killed by the same person. If he could figure out where the fibers came from, he could catch the killer. Fortunately, the fiber had an unusual structure. If he could locate its manufacturer, he'd be that much closer to solving the case. That required comparing the fiber against the hundreds of samples submitted by carpet manufacturers, an interminable and painstaking job that would add more weeks to the investigation. He couldn't do it alone. Hal Dedman, the FBI's master microanalyst, signed on to help. My initial role was to assist the Georgia Crime Laboratory in attempting to identify these fibers, to see if the manufacture of these fibers could be identified. While the search for the elusive fiber wore on, young men and boys were dying. And Atlanta was scared. As the city's anguish continued, Hyde Post of the Atlanta Journal covered the story. The mood of the city during most of the investigation was, was a, a real strong feeling of helplessness. Desperate for leads, Atlanta police canvassed victims' neighborhoods and streets near where bodies were found. They questioned people door to door, looking for any piece of information that might help them. At night, patrol cars searched the neighborhoods looking for anyone suspicious. On the streets, police had few leads, but in the lab, microanalysts were getting closer to pinpointing an original source for the unique fiber. The media caught wind that investigators were using trace evidence to tie the Atlanta area murders together. But publishing the news didn't stop the killer. It only made him change his tactics. Suddenly, instead of in the woods or dumped by the roadside, the bodies began to show up in water. The victims found in the rivers were either nude or partially clothed. Was the murderer trying to eliminate fiber evidence from being traced back to him? Lawmen suspected as much. Without alerting the media and armed with the knowledge that the killer was now disposing of the bodies in water, scores of police recruits staked out Atlanta's bridges. They were fishing for a murderer that had eluded them for 22 months. Week after week, the recruits would secretly assemble under the bridges to keep their vigil. For all their efforts, officers dubbed them trolls. All they could do was wait for the killer to strike again.
around 2 a.m. on May 22, 1981. The calm along the Chattahoochee River was broken by a splash in the darkness. The trolls waiting under the James Jackson Parkway Bridge sprang into action to find the cause. But they could not see what made the splash. They radioed to nearby officers who intercepted a station wagon and questioned the driver. His name was Wayne Bertram Williams, a 23-year-old freelance photographer and self-proclaimed music promoter. Williams didn't fit the assumed profile of the killer. In fact, as a young black man, he was more likely to be a victim. Williams told police he was coming home from a nightclub where he went to hear a new act he was considering signing. As a matter of procedure, Police searched his car, then took his name and address and sent him on his way. Two days later, the body of 27-year-old Nathaniel Cater surfaced in the Chattahoochee River, downstream from the James Jackson Parkway Bridge. Cater, a black male whom the medical examiners determined had been strangled, fit the profile of the victims murdered in the months before. He'd been dead an estimated two days. The trace evidence collected from Cater's body was sent to Peterson. Two fibers had been extracted from the victim's hair. In structure, they matched those found on the other victims. But the color didn't match. It could have faded from the water, or it could have been a mismatch. But viewing the fibers under polarized light revealed the structure of the fibers to be identical. Police decided to take a second look at Wayne Williams. After an interview and background check, a picture of Williams developed. He was a pampered only child, a college dropout at age 19, no one had seen him at the club he said he was at the night police stopped him on the bridge. Caught in this one lie, his alibi crumbled. Williams now became their chief suspect. They obtained search warrants for his house and car. Williams, feeling he had been wrongly accused because of his race, held a news conference to proclaim his innocence. But he didn't allow the press to take pictures. They openly said, you killed Nathaniel Cater, and you know it, and you're lying to us. They said that. Some members of the African-American community also found it hard to believe that Williams could be considered a suspect. I think it was very difficult for the community to believe that an African-American uh, might have committed these crimes, that an African-American had gone about systematically killing other African Americans. There was no history of black serial killers. Serial killers is a middle-aged white guy thing, or seemed to have been, and this ran counter to that pattern. In the early 1980s, DNA testing wasn't available yet. All that forensic investigators had to go on were these small fibers. The strand seemed to point to William's guilt. His house was covered with yellowish green carpet. Peterson collected as many fiber samples as he could. He also collected dog hairs and fibers from a purplish bedspread and from the trunk liner and glove compartment of William's car. Inside these bags of evidence, could lie the key to catching the murderer. Peterson was hopeful that fibers from William's house would match fibers from the victim's clothing. Took the uh, evidence back immediately to the laboratory uh, that very evening and mounted some of the samples up to see, you know, does this have any potential or not? Let's just kind of see right away. The violet acetate 
along with the green carpet fibers from Williams' home, matched the fibers found on nearly all of the victims so far. But as strong as that evidence seemed, it simply wasn't enough. To make their case, investigators faced a staggering challenge to determine how many other people in Atlanta had the exact same carpet. Based on the fiber evidence, Wayne Williams now looked like a strong suspect in the Atlanta murders. But anyone else in Atlanta with the same taste in yellow-green carpeting would be equally suspect. Police needed more to go on. They needed to find out how much of that particular yellow-green carpet was installed in Atlanta's homes. So they dug much deeper. Microscopic analysis of the fiber structure helped identify their manufacturer. The carpet was made in the early 70s, but that particular shade was produced for just one year. A little more than 16,000 yards of the carpet had ever been sold in the southeast. In Atlanta, the calculated odds that someone owned the same kind of carpet as Williams were less than one in 8,000. The evidence was stacking against Williams, but not nearly enough to win a conviction. To narrow the field, investigators compared automobile carpet fibers found on some of the victims to the rug in Williams' car. It was estimated that approximately one out of 3,500 cars in the Atlanta, Georgia area might be expected to have a carpet fiber like that found on many of the victims that were linked to Wayne Williams. Put another way, the victims would have had to randomly visit 3,500 cars plus nearly 8,000 homes in order to pick up both fibers. The odds of that happening randomly were one in more than 29 million. Add to that the purple acetate fiber from the bedspread, and it became nearly impossible that the victims could have picked up these three fibers someplace else. The numbers didn't lie. Williams was arrested. To forensic scientists, the fiber evidence was overwhelming. To a panel of jurors, it might be confusing. We wrote a story at the beginning of the trial that, that the prosecution's strongest case, strongest evidence, uh, could be contained in a thimble. More than just Williams was on trial. Prosecutors knew that the science that led to his arrest would also be scrutinized. The defense would do everything it could to snarl their credibility. If you do enough searches and you find another environment where there's that same green carpet, what are the odds that there'll be an automobile that had the same floorboard carpeting or that the family would possess the same blanket and bedspread and throw rugs and clothing items? That's really the key. That combination cannot exist. On February 27th, 1982, Wayne Williams was found guilty of killing two men the jury deliberated 11 hours. 10 other murders were definitely linked to him during the trial, and the task force closed the books on 27 murder cases between 1978 and 1981, connecting them to Williams on the same fiber evidence. The Wayne Williams case was the first time a crime was solved solely on the basis of fibers. The amount and variety of fibers found on Williams' victims snared him in a net of evidence. But in a case in Maine, investigators had far less to catch a killer. November 30th, 1990 was a brutal day in northern Maine. On that day, a worker at the Cummings Concrete Corporation in Alton called police after discovering the body of a young woman. The victim was face down. She was nude, except for the socks on her feet. The rest of her clothes were piled nearby. 
Police on the scene contacted Detective Ed Thorne of the nearby Bangor Police Department. They knew he was working on a month-old missing persons case, and the victim fit the description of the missing woman. The state police mobile crime lab was called in. Investigators were on the trail of a killer. Potentially important clues like tire tracks or footprints had to be quickly gathered before someone accidentally or intentionally destroyed the evidence. Maine State Police Crime Scene Investigator Craig Hanley supervised collection of evidence. According to Hanley, the very act of arriving on a crime scene can compromise the minute evidence. If the crime scene is not properly secured, we end up with contamination or con in inadvertent contamination sometimes by the officers themselves. It's very important for us to interview the first responders and to find out exactly where they walked, what they touched, what they moved, and what they removed. And if they've done the job properly, they should have everything noted so they can uh, explain this to us. There's nothing better than for a crime scene investigator to arrive on the scene and find it in a very uh, good condition. The scene's original condition was recorded on film, and notes were jotted down on paper. Soil samples and debris were collected. In a case that might hinge on microscopic evidence, there was no way of knowing what might become important. Investigators had two questions before them. Who was the victim, and who killed her? The body was taken to the medical examiner's office, where an autopsy was performed and a positive ID could be made. Her clothing and physical features matched those of 18-year-old Lisa Garland, the missing woman that Thorne had been searching for. She had been reported missing one month earlier. The medical examiner later confirmed her identification through fingerprints. Garland was last seen around 1 a.m. on October 27th, leaving the convenience store where she worked. She lived only a short distance away. Bangor police detective Ed Thorne had reason to believe that Garland arrived at her apartment after she left the store. What happened then is an open question. From there, she would have walked or got a ride down to a residence which is approximately 150 yards from the store. We know she arrives because her pocketbook, her keys to the house, some money, and all her belongings were there. The keys and valuables found in her house led police to believe that she had not left on her own. After a month, Detective Thorne and his colleague Bob Cameron saw their missing persons case turned into a homicide. The autopsy revealed the victim had been raped and killed by a blunt force to her head. Most of her internal organs were intact, preserved by the cool weather. At the Maine State Crime Laboratory, forensic chemist Chris Montagna analyzed trace evidence collected from the crime scene. Most notably, the socks the victim was wearing at the time of her death. He was hoping they would hold some small clue to the killer's identity. We knew that one of the key pieces of evidence that we're going to be looking at are these socks. I began to process the socks simply by doing a visual examination, seeing what I could find, if there was any hairs or fibers, uh, grass, anything that might be from the environment of the perpetrator. He found maroon fibers. Experience told him they were from the carpet of an automobile. In terms of clues, it wasn't much. But Montagna felt the entire case could hang by this one thread of evidence. In July 1991, a 15-year-old girl was riding her bike on a lonely road in York, Maine, more than 200 miles south of Bangor. A car slowly approached and forced her off the road she fell into the grassy embankment. The driver got out of the car and dragged the girl into the woods 
There, he raped her, stabbed her, and left her for dead. Amazingly, she survived. After her attacker left, she found her way to a neighbor's house where she called for help. At the York Police Department, she picked out her attacker from the mugshot file. The suspect was a convicted rapist named David Fleming, who had been released from prison just nine months earlier. In a state as quiet as Maine, news of violent crime spreads fast. After months of chasing dead-end leads to find Lisa Garland's killer, Detective Thorne heard about the violent rape in York. Bangor police became interested in David Fleming. Just maybe he had something to do with Lisa Garland's death. In York, DNA taken from the rape victim matched Fleming's DNA. Fleming pleaded guilty to raping and assaulting the young woman in York. He was sentenced to 80 years. The Lisa Garland murder case was still open. Bangor detectives believed that if they could match Fleming's DNA to samples collected at the crime scene, they'd have their man. But the DNA would have to wait. In the early 1990s, DNA testing could take months. Today, it takes weeks. If police were to prove that David Fleming killed Lisa Garland, they would need to rely on more conventional evidence. In this case, carpet fibers extracted from David Fleming's car. The fibers were sent to chemist Chris Montagna. He compared them with the ones found eight months earlier on Lisa Garland's socks. Montagna placed each fiber on a separate stage of a comparison microscope to analyze them side by side. With a few adjustments, he could see that the pattern of dark and light stripes in the fibers lined up. When laid end to end, the fibers looked like one continuous strand, indicating that they came from the same source. It looked like the breakthrough investigators needed. The match allowed detectives Thorne and Cameron to trace eight-month-old evidence back to David Fleming. Detective Bob Cameron understood the importance of the fiber evidence. The fiber that was found on the victim's sock that was matched to the carpeting on the vehicle that Fleming had been driving. And it narrowed it down considerably because the fiber that matched the carpet in the car was the only year that they had put that color carpeting in those vehicles. The results were now conclusive. The fibers matched. But would this single shred of evidence be enough to convince a jury beyond a reasonable doubt? Fortunately, an overlooked piece of evidence was found in the victim's body bag. It was a small chip of wood, hardly worth keeping. But Montagna noticed that it had been squared off, leading him to believe that the wood had been machined. Successful once with carpet fibers, Montagna asked the investigators to again comb through Fleming's car to look this time for a speck of matching wood. Inside the trunk, covered by a large cloth, lay small hand-carved wooden boats. Fleming learned to craft wood during his previous prison stints. Montagna sent the chip and the boats for analysis. The results again looked bad for Fleming. The chip was made of white pine, and so were the model boats. The wood had all been machined the same way. Now there were two strong reasons to link Fleming to Lisa Garland. The fiber evidence and the wood chip showed that Garland was in Fleming's car. But none of this evidence proved that he raped and murdered her. Establishing that Fleming killed her would be much more difficult. He appeared to have an airtight alibi. Around the same time Lisa Garland disappeared, 
he was in the hospital with serious injuries. Lisa Garland was last seen alive when she finished her shift at the convenience store in Bangor around 1 a.m. on October 27th. At around 6 a.m. that same day, David Fleming was involved in a car accident that left him hospitalized for two weeks. Fiber evidence showed that Garland was in Fleming's car. But to prove he was her killer, detectives had to pinpoint exactly when she could have been there. Fleming would have had two chances to abduct Garland. The first was in the five hours between the time she disappeared and the time he had his accident. The second was the two-week period between Fleming's release from the hospital and when Garland's body was found. An examination revealed that she was killed shortly after she was raped. But the cold weather had preserved her body and made it impossible to determine how long she'd been dead. Police knew she could not have been in Fleming's car while he was in the hospital and the car was being repaired. So if they could prove she was dead before Fleming was hospitalized, it would mean that Fleming was her killer. Police needed some way of narrowing the time frame. Bangor police learned that an aerial photo of the crime scene was taken two weeks before the victim's body was found. While examining the photos, investigators made a startling discovery. At first, it was blurry and indistinct but an enlargement brought it into focus. There, in the pit, lay the body of Lisa Garland. Here was photographic proof that the victim was dead before Fleming was hospitalized. That meant she must have been in his car before his accident. The fiber had placed Garland in Fleming's car. The photograph established the time of death. All indications pointed to Fleming as the killer. Detectives Thorne and Cameron felt they now had all the evidence they needed to win a conviction. Then came the clincher. The analysis of the DNA from the crime scene came back from the lab. The DNA test was done at the FBI lab, and the results were that uh, Fleming was definitely a match. At the trial, the events of that night were reconstructed by the prosecution based on police speculation. Lisa Garland did make it home just after one o'clock in the morning on October 27th. David Fleming had followed her from the store. As she walked into her apartment, she forgot to lock the door behind her, a simple mistake that would prove fatal. David Fleming saw his opportunity. He then went into her apartment. It's not clear where he committed the crime, but fiber evidence proved that Garland's body was in Fleming's Delta 88 before he dumped it by the sand pit in the town of Alton. Fleming then returned home, where his girlfriend remembered him walking in around 3 o'clock in the morning. She recalled him not sleeping soundly and leaving around 5 a.m. About an hour later, Fleming got into an accident with an 18-wheeler. He was out of commission for two weeks, but the evidence showed he had already committed his crime. The fiber evidence linked the victim to his car. The photograph established an approximate time of her death. And the car accident closed his window of opportunity to just a sliver. On March 22, 1995, David Fleming was convicted of raping and murdering Lisa Garland. He is serving a life sentence on top of the 80 years for the rape in York. In case after case, fiber evidence has linked victims to their killers. But in a case in Florida, investigators relied on fibers to reconstruct the circumstances of a fatal car accident. 
On a road in Tallahassee, Florida, in 1994, a mild October evening turned terribly tragic. Strewn among broken beer bottles, snapped tree limbs, and mangled car parts lay the lifeless body of 30-year-old Michael Manella. A second victim, named Curtis Davison, was able to summon help before returning to the scene and collapsing. As paramedics treated Davison, Tallahassee police sized up the scene of the fatal accident. For crash investigators, time is even more critical than at a homicide investigation. At a homicide, officers can cordon off the crime scene and return to it later. Not so with a car wreck. Officers get just one chance to collect evidence. Traffic must return to normal as soon as possible. Crash investigators often rely on eyewitness accounts as a first source of information. But no one had seen this late night crash. No one other than survivor Curtis Davison, and he was in no condition to make a statement. Crash homicide investigator Mike Walker had to rely on preliminary judgments based on the evidence he saw at the accident scene. And what really struck me Im immediately was uh, the passenger side of the vehicle was totally destroyed. The passenger door was nearly torn off the vehicle. We had an intact driver side of the vehicle. To Walker, that meant the passenger of the car would have sustained the most severe injuries. It was doubtful he could have survived, let alone walk away from the crash. But Davison told police he was the passenger. By some fluke, that may have been true. But could it be possible that Davison was lying to avoid being prosecuted for his friend's death? It was Walker's job to find out the truth. Investigators questioned anyone who might have seen the men before the crash. Witnesses told police that the two met at a local bar after work where they had several drinks. They were then seen in another bar later that evening. Around 1 a.m., they left the bar and drove off together. But no one saw them get into the car. Without any witness, the detectives would have to rely on forensics to tell them who was driving. They first had to determine all they could about the crash and what factors were involved like how fast the car was traveling. Returning to the crime scene the next morning, Walker and his partner, David Folsom, found the clues they needed. The 300ZX suspect vehicle was traveling northbound on this road. As it rounded the curb, he began to lose control. The driver turned the wheel to follow the curve, but the car's inertia kept it moving forward. As it left the road, it began to spin. Then it hit a tree. The vehicle continued sliding sideward, striking another tree. As it struck the other tree, it went airborne, approximately 40 feet, landing back in the road. When a fast-moving vehicle changes direction, the tires slide sideways, leaving scuff marks on the road. By measuring these marks, called critical speed scuffs, and factoring in the friction of the road surface, Investigators can calculate how fast the car was moving as it sped out of control. The measurements from the critical speed scuff uh, indicated that the vehicle was traveling at 89 to 96 miles per hour. Almost from the start of the investigation, police had a hunch alcohol played a role. Broken beer bottles were found at the scene, and paramedics and officers detected alcohol on Davison's breath and on Manella's body. If Davison was the driver and was under the influence at the time, investigators needed to test his blood alcohol level, and quickly. A blood sample was taken within two hours of the crash. So what time did you start? It's very important that once we establish that there's 
suspicion that he is the driver of a vehicle, then we have to obtain a blood sample because alcohol dissipates from the system. Walker and Folsom ordered the blood work that morning. The sample was taken to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Crime Lab to determine its alcohol level. First, the analyst takes a carefully measured portion of the blood she wants to test and places it into a clean, labeled vial. The alcohol in the blood is volatile. As the blood is shaken, it evaporates into the air or headspace of the vial. It's the components of the blood in the headspace and not the blood itself that's tested. The gas in the headspace is drawn into a chromatograph, which identifies its components and their concentration. The computer looks specifically for alcohol in the blood gases. In 10 minutes, it provides a reading. The results showed Davison's blood alcohol level at 0.04 safely below Florida's legal limit. But that was the level when his blood was drawn at the hospital, not the level he had at the time of the accident. Because alcohol dissipates from the bloodstream at a consistent rate, the analyst can calculate what the level was two hours earlier when the accident occurred. Davison's level at the time of the crash was estimated to be between 0 0.06 and 0 0.08. In Florida, a level as low as 0 0.051 can be considered driving under the influence. But investigators still had to prove that he was behind the wheel. Back at his office, Walker pored over the accident scene photos and compared them to his notes. Parts of Davison's story weren't adding up. First was the car's restraining system. Walker recalled the driver's side airbag had been deployed. Airbags, by design, pin the driver in place. If Manella were driving, it seemed unlikely he'd have been thrown from the vehicle. Yet his body was found some 50 feet from where the car came to rest. On the other hand, the passenger's side seat belt looked like it hadn't even been used. Whoever sat here could have been thrown. One more clue aroused suspicion. A bloody handprint on the outside of the driver's side door. It was too smudged to read, but it seemed likely it was made when the driver exited the car after the accident. But according to Folsom, the evidence could be misleading. Now, traditionally, we cannot say that just because there's a bloody handprint that someone uh, driving that car put it there because there's such thing as scene contamination. One of the rescue personnel or one of the police officers could have done it. But it was enough to spur suspicion as to who was actually the driver, the deceased or the survivor. By themselves, the evidence of a bloody handprint, minor injuries, and an unused seat belt meant very little. Taken together, they created serious doubt about Davison's story. Davison, however, was sticking to it, insisting that he was the passenger. The definitive version of the tale would be told in the lab. Investigators faced no shortage of clues about the car crash that claimed a man's life. The trick was to make sense of them. Crash investigator Mike Walker had the wreck towed to a secure impound facility for analysis. Ward Schwab is an analyst at the Department of Law Enforcement lab. One of the parts of my job as a crime scene analyst is to go and examine a vehicle without any outside influences. A lot of the times I'll go and look at the vehicle itself and try not to learn any of the particulars about the case. I'll take an objective view of the vehicle, see what I can determine, see what the evidence tells me. To piece together the particulars, he began with the driver's side seatbelt 
fastening it in a position as if someone were wearing it. He noticed spots on the seat belt near the door. They tested positive for human blood. That indicated the seat belt was probably worn at the time of the crash. It also meant that whoever wore it was probably not ejected from the car. Signs again pointed to Davison. The evidence was suggestive, but slippery. Even if the blood proved to be Davison's, the defense could argue that it could have spattered onto the belt while the car was spinning, or that Davison could have bled on it after the crash as he staggered around the car. To seal this case, investigators needed to find evidence that fit three criteria. First, the evidence could be left only at the moment of impact. Second, it had to be unique to the individual who left it. And third, it had to prove where that person was sitting in the car. Investigators depended on fibers to meet those criteria. And they depended on regional crime lab microanalyst Paula Sauer to read them. Detectives Walker and Folsom gave Sauer several pieces of material evidence collected from the accident scene, including a dashboard with two dents in it and clothing worn by the victims. The dents in the dash were on the passenger's side. It was presumed they were caused by contact with the passenger's knees. Remarkably, the force of the crash created so much frictional heat that woven patterns and fibers were actually melted into the vinyl. There were fibers, numerous fibers, embedded in the dashboard area that would be directly in front of the passenger seat. These fibers were microscopically consistent with the fibers composing Manella's pants. The evidence seemed to indicate that Manella was in the passenger seat. But Sauer wouldn't stop there. She scrutinized every piece of evidence to be certain her results were consistent. She turned her attention to strands of human hair and synthetic fibers gathered from the cracks of the passenger side of the windshield. Michael Manella wore a hairpiece composed of both human hair and synthetic fibers. If the fibers from his hairpiece matched those in the windshield, it would strengthen the argument that he was the passenger and that Davison, the survivor of the crash, was driving. An inspection of the synthetic hairs, using a high-power comparison microscope, suggested the fibers in the windshield matched those in Manella's hairpiece. But analyzing these fibers required more than a visual inspection because of the small size of their molecules. To complete her comparison, Sauer used an instrument called a Foyer Transform Infrared Spectrometer, or FTIR. It is an instrument that is used to determine the generic class of synthetic fibers. By generic class, I mean whether it's nylon, polyester, acrylic. And this technique is very effective in that manner because it's actually looking at the molecules that are making up those fibers so it can give you and exact identification. The characteristics of both fibers were displayed on a computer. The red lines represent fibers from the hairpiece. The green lines represent fibers pulled from the windshield. In every way, they were identical. So far, all indications were that Manella was in the passenger seat. If that were true, it meant Davison would have left his mark in the area of the driver's seat, most likely on the airbag, which would have deployed at over 100 miles per hour. Sauer analyzed fibers clinging to the tightly woven fabric of the airbag. She found nine fibers matching the fabric of Davison's pants. Her conclusion? Davison was driving. Paula Sauer used her sophisticated optics to put the accident scene into focus. Not only had she placed Manella in the passenger seat, but also determined that Davison was the driver. The evidence was handed over to the state's attorney, 
who showed in court that Davison lied about the events that unfolded in the early morning hours of October 6, 1994. The prosecution's theory was that after a night of drinking, it was Curtis Davison who got behind the wheel of Manila's Nissan 300ZX. Anxious to test the sports car's power, Davison put it in high gear, racing down the tree-lined two-lane road. Ignoring the 35 mile per hour signs, Davison climbed toward 90. Then the narrow road started to curve and Davison lost control. No longer heeding the steering wheel, the car slid sideways and careened off an oak tree. Michael Manella, in the passenger seat, was thrown from the vehicle. He wasn't wearing a seatbelt. The sports car continued to spin out of control, smashing into another tree before coming to rest on the side of the road. Davison, saved by the airbag, crawled out of the car. He went around to the passenger side to look for Manella, his bloody left hand leaving a smear on the door. Manella was dead in the road. Davison went for help. A Tallahassee jury took just 10 minutes to find Davison guilty of manslaughter by culpable negligence. He was sentenced to seven years. The analysis of tiny fibers, traces of evidence found in ordinary items, turned the tables on three men who denied any involvement in their respective crimes. The ability of forensic scientists to pinpoint the makeup of fiber down to the most microscopic detail allows prosecutors to tear alibis into shreds of evidence.